Hello, and welcome back to Unique's Digital Experience and Artificial Intelligence Week. This is day three. I'm Julian Wadsworth. And I'm Caroline Busta from New Models in Berlin. New Models is a media platform and community focused on the emergent effects of network technology on politics and society. We'd like to thank Unique very much for having us as your moderators. As New Models is rooted in the world of art and cultural production, with keen interest in how tech is shaping the way we think creatively, we are especially looking forward to today's program. We will spend this session in the part of the Venn diagram where human expression and machine learning overlap. And also thinking about a question that I might argue is as much sociological as it is philosophical. What we consider to be art in a time of neural nets and machine generated expression. For those who are just tuning in, Unique is the European Union National Institutes for Culture, the network of organizations from national cultural institutes to ministries of foreign affairs, engaging in cultural relations across the EU to strengthen dialogue, cultural, cultural cooperation, and diversity. Last night, Unique's Silicon Valley hosted a, a fascinating session stemming from their initiative, The Grid, on how art powers technology. Speaking to both leaders of Bay Area European Cultural Institutes and to creators and thinkers, including Patrick Hebron of Adobe's Machine Intelligence Design Group and Tobias Rees, director of the Bikrun Institute. In yesterday's earlier session, we meditated on the geopolitical implications of artificial intelligence with a primer course in AI defining some terms from Catherine Jarmul, Jarmul of Cape Privacy and a panel discussion with three high level experts in the field of machine learning and art of, uh, artificial intelligence and its ethical impact. Dataethics.eu co-founder Gri Hasselbach Professor of Law, Ethics, and Informatics at the University of Birmingham, Karen Young, and Martin Rochberger, who is uh, Ralph Ralph Bauer. Bauer, who is both the Austrian tech ambassador to Silicon Valley, as well as board member of the unique pilot project, The Grid. Um, we want to just make a note that all of the previous sessions are now up on Unique Global's YouTube. You can find their YouTube by going to Unique global.eu and scrolling down to the bottom of the page and then clicking on the icons. You all know how to do this. Anyway, all the sessions are there as individual speaker sessions, so you can cherry pick which ones are most relevant to your interests. Um, during the talk last night, there was much discussion of how important it is to bring artists into the tech conversation, to listen to artists, to be inspired by the way they see the world. In a sense, of course, this is true and commendable. However, I would hope that in this session to come, we might problematize that sentiment in two ways. One, what does it mean when via machine learning, a non-human neural net can auto-generate expression that compels us to think differently? And two, how does the nature of art change when understood by its community as a communication tool or as a source of R&D? In today's session, which will go on till about 2 p.m. European time, we will- uh, CET, CET time. CET time. <laughs> Berlin time, we will begin with two experts thinking about creativity and artificial intelligence, Professor Marcus du Satoy and Octavio Kules, followed by a conversation with curator Marnie Benny, who works explicitly with artists involved in machine learning. And then a talk from an artist who works with machine learning, <laughs> Sophia Crespo. We would then like you to uh, we would then like to invite you to join us again tonight at 6 p.m. Central European time for live stream performances and conversations with and by artists Hexor Sisimos and Yena Sutella, both of whom work with and through machine learning. Before we begin, though, we just want to give a, a few, uh, like a brief overview of the tech. If this is day three for you, you're already very familiar with this, um, but it whatever we will still say it again. If you're, if you're uh, accessing this via Zoom, that's the primary format. You can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, please ask questions continuously throughout this. You, not, you don't need to wait till the end of the presentation. We will then look back through these questions and we will pose them to the speakers. Um, we welcome your comments and insights uh, as well. So uh, feel free to participate in the conversation uh, via questions or comments using the Q&A button in Zoom. And feel free to add links to the chat that you feel are relevant. 
uh, we can really make this a community space, especially today as we're thinking about like building community through artistic expression. Um, at the end of this session, we will also ask you to join us or invite you to join us uh, on an ancillary platform we've been using called wonder.me. And Pedro, will, our, our person who's handling our tech, will uh, add the link to the chat at the end. This is sort of like an informal coffee break space where you can speak with some of the speakers who have time. You can speak with each other in a very interesting like geospatial interface, uh, which in any case is just interesting to check out if you're not already familiar with it. Um, also want to say a few credits. Uh, the curation and production of this week's event is due to the work of Jeanette Neustadt of the Goethe Institute. Um, the concept is by Gita Schock of UNIC. The technical production is by Pedro Yardim of New Kin Co. Animations and technical support by Tim Novikov. Graphic design by Amelie Bakker and Atelier Brenda. The coordination is Lina Kiryav. Uh, yeah, Roviate and Giacomo Corongio. I really hope I get this by the end. Um, and Rob <laughs> Gronjo, Gronjo, and Robert Keefe, and uh, the moderation, Caroline Busta, Julian Wadsworth of New Models. And we'll even put all these links to seed the uh, to seed the conversation into the chat right now. So here you go. Let's see. There you go. So there's some links to start off the chat. Um, all right, so now without further ado, we are going to hear from Professor Marcus Dusatoy and Octavio Kules. Each will give a presentation and then we will bring both on together for a short exchange. First up, we'd like to welcome Marcus Dusatoy, the Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science and Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. He wrote The Music of the Primes, a book exploring the history and mysteries of prime number theory, and this year authored The Creativity Code, exploring the future and mysteries of creativity and machine learning. Can machine learning compose a great work of art? And if it does, what will the algorithms and mathematics behind artificial creativity teach us about our own creativity? Most importantly, Professor Dusatoy offers a vision of what machine learning creativity means for humans and perhaps what it means to be human itself. So Professor Marcus Dusatoy, hello from Berlin to London, where I believe you are in Quar. Um, the digital stage is now yours. Great. Well, it's uh, welcome. Uh, uh, great to join you all. And uh, I think the really little challenge here is whether AI can be creative at all. Um, I mean, after all, isn't creativity something which is about being uniquely human, exploring our own inner world, sharing those uh, with others? Um, how, how could AI be creative if actually the AI is originally written as code by a, a human? Um, and it's interesting, the first person to actually think about code to get machines to do interesting things, Ada Lovelace. Um, we celebrate Ada Lovelace Day every year in October. Um, she went uh, with her mother to see um, Charles Babbage's analytic engine, um, a machine which was being used to speed up mathematical calculations. And she already realized that this machine might be able to do sort of more interesting things and started writing instructions, which we now regard as the first sort of code to get a machine to, to do um, more interesting things than just mathematical calculations. Um, but already in those notes that she started writing, she's speculating about uh, the kind of limits of what this thing could do. And she wrote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So she's already thinking about the idea that this machine, given the right sort of code, um, could actually produce something uh, artistic, something that we generally regard as, as very human, music. Um, but she has a word of caution about uh, the creativity of the machine. She says, it's desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as the powers of the analytic engine. The machine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. And I think for many, many years, we've really felt that, you know, it's the human writing the code. So if the machine produces some music, we really should credit um, the human as the creative one. The machine's just implemented the ideas of the human. And I think that's a very fair comment of the code in the past, because 
code was written in a very sort of top-down manner. The human told the machine what to do. It may be able to implement it faster, deeper than a human can. But we, I've really seen a phase change in the way that we're writing code. And uh, this is something that's already been explored, uh, the idea of machine learning. The idea that um, a piece of code can interact with the world around it and through its interaction um, actually uh, change, mutate, update itself. Um, and this learning process, I think, is giving rise to the possibility um, that code can start to disconnect itself from the coder such that the output of the code um, we should really regard as um, the creativity of the code um, through its learning process, uh, learning on data, and that it isn't the original coder that we should regard uh, as the one, uh, the human who's, who, who's the creative one. And for me, uh, that the real phase change happened uh, where I really recognized that a moment of true AI creativity took place um, was in the context of a game. Uh, some of you may remember this story. It was the uh, when a piece of code called AlphaGo um, challenged uh, the world's best human at the game, ancient game of uh, Go. This is a game played on a 19 by 19 grid and players put black and white stones down and the aim is to try and enclose more of your opponent's territory than they are of yours. And traditionally, that was this is a game that was very hard to write code um, to, to play because uh, it's uh, the way that Go players played relied on a lot of intuition, creativity, pattern searching um, in the stones as they began to build up uh, on the board. Uh, and so traditionally, we weren't really able to write code to play this game. But with this idea of machine learning, where uh, the machine, the code can take old human games, analyze those, see which moves were somehow giving uh, a player an edge. Uh, when it ran out of human games, it tried it made synthetic games, uh, it started playing itself and updating the version that was more powerful and winning more often. Um, and so this produced a piece of code that was able to um, beat uh, Lee Sedol um, at this game. Uh, now, we got quite used to computers and AI doing things faster, better than humans, but what was really fascinating was something that happened in the second game of that match, um, because, uh, uh, at, this was a moment when I think that AlphaGo came up with a sort of move that uh, we'd never really seen before. Um, it was a move that traditionally is regarded as very weak. Um, so on the 37th move of game two, AlphaGo um, asked the human player to place a stone uh, down on the fifth row in from the edge. Interestingly, we still need humans to place the stones on the board because um, uh, this little bit of kit that we've uh, developed um, is actually better than any robot at the moment. Um, but the thinking was being done by the AI. Um, and I remember I was watching these games rather obsessively on uh, YouTube. And I remember the commentators um, gasping at what a terrible move the AlphaGo had made because early on in the game, you're not meant to play very deep into the board. It's sort of competition for kind of the edge of the board is what is regarded as good go playing. Um, and the human commentators thought, oh, well, uh, here's one for the humans to win now because uh, somehow a weak move like that, Lisa Dole will be able to completely demolish the code. But what turned out to happen was um, competition began to emerge for sort of uh, territory building up from the bottom right hand corner of the board. And it turned out that the person who laid that stone down, AlphaGo, the code, not a person actually, um, uh, on the 37th move was the one who controlled that whole area and won the game. And for me, this uh, passes three tests that I'm looking for um, if I'm going to call something creative. Um, I like a definition that Margaret Bowden, a cognitive scientist, came up with, and I think it's quite useful to take forward in this discussion. Um, she defined creativity as something which is new, surprising, and has value. So novelty is quite objective. We can judge that quite cleanly, but a surprise is interesting because that's engaging with our emotions where we get taken outside ourselves. And I think that's the exciting thing with uh, creativity in art. It is that kind of uh, 
helping us to see the world in a new way, that emotional uh, reaction uh, that you're trying to elicit to, to change the viewpoint of uh, the person looking or listening or reading the art. Um, and uh, But it shouldn't just be shock value for its own sake. It should have some sort of value uh, in the long run. And for me, that move really did have all of those three qualities. But the really crucial thing for me is that if a human had seen that line of code play on the fifth row in from the edge, a human uh, would have said, well, that's a really bad move. Let's delete that line of code. Um, so for me, this, this uh, move really came out of the learning process of the code. The code understood how to use this move um, in a valuable way. And it's genuinely shifted the way that humans play this game. Uh, and I think that's the exciting role that um, AI will play in the realm of creativity is that I think humans, we often end up behaving uh, rather mechanistically. We repeat behaviors as creative artists. We've been successful with one thing in the past and we, it, it's, it, it's very easy to keep on using the same ideas. I know that I'm a mathematician and I very often fall back on old modes of thought that were successful. And what I find exciting is um, here's AlphaGo saying, you know, um, there is a way to exploit that move deep into the board to give you value. Um, and I think for me, we've seen Go players actually being shifted off what they thought was the peak way of playing, like a little hill. They thought it was a massive mountain, but the AI has cleared a fog around this hill and revealed um, much taller mountains around us, better ways to play this game. And so seeing this moment where I think that um, at this kind of broke Love Ada Lovelace's idea that um, it can't originate ever anything. This truly did originate through its learning process, its interaction with data. Um, I think we're seeing something which needs to be credited as the creativity of the code. And it set me off on this journey to, to write this book, uh, The Creativity Code, because I was fascinated to know, okay, a game is a very restricted domain. Um, uh, what about things which are much more human, like music, as Ada Lovelace suggested, um, visual art, the written word, um, even my own subject of mathematics, which I regard as very creative. So um, in the book, I was very interested to see what the impact of this AI creativity has had on, on more human uh, realms. I think music was a fascinating one because music has some connections with kind of mathematics and the idea of pattern. And certainly we've seen AI picking up um, the idea of style and replicating things. But I was interested more in, in not just pastiche or uh, seeing things that we know already just more of the same. Uh, can AI take us into the new like um, the AI AlphaGo did in helping us to play this game in a new way. Um, and I was very fascinated in one story where um, Bernard Lubat, a, a pian jazz pianist, um, improvised alongside a, a jazz AI improviser that picked up um, uh, Bernard Lubat's style, started playing back things in, in his world. But it was Bernard Lubat's reaction. Uh, he said, well, I recognize that world. That is my world that it's playing but it's making suggestions of things to do with my world that I've never ever thought of doing before. And it, it's actually years ahead of what I might do. And for me, that's the exciting thing, AI being used as a tool to kick us out of um, a very sort of machine-like behaviors, perhaps making us creative again as humans. Um, the visual world is actually where I think machine learning has been uh, an AI through this machine learning process has been most successful, uh, learning on the huge amount of visuals, uh, but then moving into the new. And I've seen some very interesting art appearing from um, a new sort of algorithm called a generative adversarial network, which is actually two algorithms working against each other in a sort of game. And I think it actually mimics very nicely the way that uh, the human creative mind works, where there's one side which is very generative, bubbly, and the other side, which is a kind of discriminator, um, which is judging what's appearing. And these GANs uh, have started to push visuals really into um, a new realm. But interestingly, one of the stories I think is most important in the visual realm hasn't produced visually interesting art, but I think actually goes to the heart of why we humans make art, which is actually this idea 
of examining our inner worlds. Um, I, I, I like Carl Rogers, a psychologist idea of creativity is our tool to examine our conscious worlds and see whether my conscious world is anything like yours, um, whether my pain is anything like yours. And this code that's emerging is so complex and that we actually don't understand how it's thinking, how it's making up its mind about things. Well, mind, what does it have a mind, but decisions it's making. Um, for example, visual recognition software, it's able to recognize things, but what is it actually seeing? And a project called Deep Dream by Google um, actually used the visual production of the AI to sort of ask questions about what it was actually uh, seeing. And, and that for me is an interesting tool, um, not AI just to help humans, but humans to help to understand the inner world of AI. I think that's where art may play a very interesting role. One place that AI, I think, was very unsuccessful is in the written word, um, which uh, may be good news for me as a, a, as a writer. Um, you know, can it write a book like this? Um, I'm just going to finish with a little passage because it was, I thought, uh, rather sweet in uh, AI trying to um, reproduce a new volume of Harry Potter. Um, Botnik uh, is a group in America, a group of coders and artists, and they love Harry Potter. There's enough perhaps data for people to learn on. And uh, so they they got the machine learning to, to learn on JK Rowling's world. And um, actually it started off pretty well. I, I love the title uh, the AI came up with. It was uh, the portrait of Harry Potter and the portrait of what looked like a large pile of ash. A great, great title for a novel. I'll read that one. Um, anyway, it started off quite well. Magic, it was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Well, pretty good. It's picked up that magic is a major theme in these books. Uh, leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Oh, I love that idea. Leathery sheets of rain. I'm not sure I would come up with such a, a, a lovely image. So um, I think it's doing pretty well. But, but from that point on, it really began to lose the plot. Um, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. Um, he saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Uh, Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so I think uh, writers probably uh, are safe. JK Rowling's probably safe. And, um, but I think there's an interesting role that uh, AI will be playing in the written word as well. Short form, it's actually quite good. I, I got actually a piece of AI to write 350 words of this book and my editor even hasn't been able to identify the passage, which I find vaguely depressing because I thought it was so obviously bad, but um, there you go. Um, but I think one of the interesting things for me will be as a writer, one of the frustrations is I have to write one book that works on many minds. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a collaboration with an AI which writes a bespoke book for each person because the AI knows the books that you've read, the things you know about, perhaps you know what an algorithm is and I don't have to uh, talk about that. Perhaps you've never, ever encountered an algorithm. So the idea of bespoke um, uh, creativity for the particular person because of knowing them, I think is a very interesting opportunity uh, that we might have ahead. And I think this is the exciting thing. This is, this is a period where we've got a new tool to examine the data that we have, our inner worlds. Um, and I think, uh, although Hollywood portrays AI as a kind of uh, very dystopically as a competitor, I think we need to regard AI as a very powerful collaborator going forward. And I think we're gonna hear some interesting stories uh, during the morning uh, about the way that AI is helping artists to, to really push into the new. Thank you, Marcus. That's a fascinating, fascinating entry into this conversation. And I love this idea of AI not being something that we're competing with or something that is a threat to us, but rather the agent that allows us, that nudges us to be human. It opens up the capacity to think as humans, to think uh, nonlinearly, to, 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 uh, to think in ways that one cannot program. That's a beautiful way of saying it. I think we have one very quick question and, and then we'll hand the stage over to Octavio and then we'll bring you back on. But do you want to just ask the, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not that quick of a question. Oh, it's but I, it's I, not. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, thinking about our own, <laughs> I'm thinking about our own uh, sort of swarm intelligence, especially in the age of, of YouTube, where we uh, see uh, our artistic or creative practice sort of formalized into uh, tutorials. tutorials and tropes uh, that we sort of together 
discover what works the best in a very noisy and competitive uh, attention marketplace. And uh, you see us sort of repeating the things that work in a what would be thought of as maybe perhaps a more mechanistic than creative like Spotify, sort of mode. for instance, makes us do that, right? Right. It incentivizes particular um, ways of production. So I like the idea of AI being a disruptor of that. But I, I wanted to mention, I, I believe it was Douglas Hofstadter who, who said, uh, analogy is the core of cognition. And I wonder where uh, analogy plays into uh, machine learning creativity. Uh, if it's capable of high level analogy and also where chaos uh, and that randomness uh, figures in because I, I almost feel like the creative process is a bit of randomness to break a, a, break a rule, uh, but also to, to make an analogy that still connects to the human. I'm not quite sure if machine learning is actually makes analogies too, too loose, like leathery rain, or um, if it's actually not so good at making analogies, and maybe you could clarify that a bit. Gosh, uh, so, <laughs> so many uh, things there uh, to tackle. I mean, I mean, let me just talk about chaos and randomness a little bit, because that's really fascinating, because quite often I saw that um, uh, people were putting, using randomness to give an illusion of a decision-making process going on, choices being made by the AI. And I think that's a cheat um, because uh, uh, that's coming from something external. And it, it's, um, it gives an illusion that there's something uh, interesting happening because you can't predict it, but, but also the AI can't predict that as well. But chaos is very different because chaos is uh, deterministic, but unpredictable. And, and that I think is the mo more interesting way that um, uh, code is tapping into uh, nonlinear um, uh, processes and, and producing uh, things which, you know, a very small perturbation by one person can take it off in a different direction. And I think that's very, uh, what you mentioned Spotify, the best algorithms, recommender algorithms are those that actually um, are chaotic in nature. So we aren't all being, I mean, my fear was recommender algorithms, we'd all be um, converging on the same pieces of music, same books, and it would uh, actually kill uh, the sort of smaller um, creative acts. But actually that's not happening. Uh, we're, I'm finding myself discovering things I never would have, thanks to the kind of uh, very sensitive, chaotic nature of these recommenders. An analogy is very powerful, I think. So, uh, and I think, interestingly, you're seeing some AI uh, using, uh, you know, kind of learning style from one place, perhaps music, and then implementing it visually. And that's a very interesting sort of, uh, you know, you, you want to use um, sort of ideas in one realm and, and take them to another. I think that's often where analogy is very powerful, uh, certainly in science, an analogy or a metaphor for example. Um, so yeah, I think Douglas Hofstadter, uh, his, uh, I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Doug and uh, know him well. Uh, I, I think that, you know, he's, he's very critical of what AI, I mean, I, I had a conversation with him last year. He doesn't think AI can be creative at all. He's very down on uh, AI. Um, and he's got some very interesting uses of uh, translator algorithms, which just totally miss the point, uh, whilst we can pick up things. I think that's interesting, because we have a context, a social, um, historical, um, uh, uh, you know, there's so much more data that we're tapping into, especially with language, which an AI very often is just limited in the data set it's being given. And, and, and that that is a big difference at the moment that we we have a sort of general intelligence and, and AI is still quite narrow because of the data set it's being given. I would offer also that humans have sometimes a hyper local data set, which is also very important to making art, which AI may or may not have. So I think that scale works in both directions. Yeah, but scale is a really interesting word there. And I think that's very important because you talked about um, swarm mentality. Uh, I think there's something that uh, AI is able to do at scale that we can't. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen in the digital humanities, the ability to tap into an AI that can read the whole of Victorian literature. <laughs> well, and then there are books which haven't been read by humans. Uh, and we got really focused on just a small number of great uh, Victorian novels. Yet there are things in there that perhaps today are, are perhaps more relevant than they were um, in, in Victorian times. So I think, you know, using Absolutely. this in the digital humanities could, uh, you know, it, it gives us a, an ability to look at things at scale. I think it's a little bit like the moment suddenly Galileo was given a telescope and <laughs> you could see things that you never could before. And that's the possibility we've got to ex explore. What can we see that we couldn't see before thanks to this technology? Lo lovely entree to this.